have you ever dated somebody who seemed interested in a relationship with you and at the same time needed a lot of space? Maybe they struggle to fulfill your needs, to compromise, to communicate about feelings and have difficult conversations. And you felt like they were there physically, but emotionally there was this big gap. And maybe you felt really unfulfilled and lonely in the relationship. Maybe you are in that relationship right now, or perhaps you're looking back at your relationship history and trying to make sense of what happened. Or perhaps you are the person who enjoys relationships when they are going well. Maybe you enjoy that honeymoon phase between the one to three months mark where everything is really smooth. And then when it comes to commitment, you start to fear that you're going to lose yourself. Your partner's needs might feel very big and suffocating and you are scared of being trapped in a relationship or being a negative impact on your partner. What I've just described are symptoms of a dismissive avoidant attachment style. This attachment style was created in childhood through emotional neglect. A lot of dismissive avoidance, when they look back at their life, they don't see any obvious traumas. They often struggle to remember big chunks of their past. And this is why they often struggle to also seek help because they can't really pinpoint what went wrong. Emotional neglect is this very silent kind of trauma that we go through or something that is very overwhelming to the nervous system that a child struggles to deal with. And the way that we deal with things when we are young is that we create these strategies to deal with what is going on in our family life. So my name is Patricia Mahatska and on this channel I create videos for healing attachment styles and creating healthy relationships and learning how to shift out of those survival patterns that we have learned while we are growing up that are now causing a lot of havoc in our relationships and just in our daily lives, self-sabotage, procrastination. And then we learn to heal that, repattern our subconscious and shift to thriving in all areas of our lives because we all deserve lives of love, safety and freedom like the dismissive avoidance really want. So in this video, I am going to talk about the five unrealistic relationship expectations that dismissive avoidance have due to the way they grew up. And I'm going to link this to the core wounds. So core wounds, you can call them limiting belief systems or negative belief systems that are rooted in our subconscious that are now ruling our lives. So let's start with number one, which is my partner must be self-reliant. So considering that dismissive avoidance grew up in an environment that was full of emotional neglect, which means that when a child was dysregulated, there was nobody home perhaps, maybe parents worked or there were parents at home and they were very intellectual. So they just said to the child, you know what, go to your room, play with your toys and feel better. So the child figured out that it doesn't really feel good for me to rely on other people. My vulnerability is either neglected, it is dismissed, and in some situations it got shamed. So perhaps one or both parents were quite harsh with the child, blaming the child or call, calling the child a sissy for having these vulnerable emotions. Or perhaps the child grew up in a boarding school or perhaps in a foster care, all right? So somewhere where there was no nurturing of the emotional, uh, emotional component of the child, so the child then closed up and believed that I have to handle all of my needs by myself. Clearly, this is what life is about. Everybody is doing this. My parents are doing this. Remember that when we are growing up, we look to our parents as these demigods. They are all powerful and we believe that they know everything. So if they are doing it, we must do it as well. And this is what life is. So when they believe that 
this is it, I, am, I need to be completely self-reliant, they will also look at their partner and believe, my partner must also be self-reliant. I was never a, allowed to ask anybody for help. And you might notice that dismissive avoidance get short, sharp, dismissive, or ignore their, their partner's bids for connection, um, which can come across as uh, soothing. Maybe their partner wants to soothe with them. And dismissive avoidance have never had this opportunity. They didn't really develop, the, uh, develop um, co-regulation skills so they self-regulate okay they don't really self-regulate they usually numb their emotions or distract themselves from their emotions or over intellectualize their emotions so they think that everybody else should do the same so my partner must be completely independent financially emotionally in every possible way especially emotionally so they my partner must not soothe through me my partner must not rely on me so my partner must figure out their own way how to get to the airport and how to get back from the airport. Or if my partner is going through something with their family, they need to go through that by themselves. And they believe that the best thing that you can give to a person when they are going through something is time and space away. So most people or most attachment styles believe that you want to move towards somebody when there is trauma happened say for example there's a death in the family whereas dismissive avoidance might back away and believe that you actually need space so you as their partner get very confused because you think this is the time when i really need you and a dismissive avoidant tends to create space and that is for two main um uh, reasons. The one reason is that they feel inadequate in relationships. They feel overwhelmed with emotions, with their partner's emotions, because they were never taught how to co-regulate, how to regulate emotions and make each other feel better in connection. And they also feel now inadequate, like they don't really know what to do with these emotions. It's like a hot potato. So they tend to back away from the situation. So they have that belief that when I get into a relationship, my partner must be completely, completely independent. And a lot of emotionally uh, or anxious preoccupied rather, when they get into a relationship, they pretend to be hyper independent, which they are not. And this is why often they pair together because the dismissive avoidant wants to be with a person who doesn't need anything from them. So the anxious preoccupied doesn't want to scare away anybody with their needs. And they think, let's get into a relationship. And then this person is going to start showing up more and more. And eventually I will tell them about my needs. Or perhaps they try to be very independent and then they realize it's like holding their breath. They can't really do it for a very long period of time. And then eventually they have needs from their partner. And because they matched at a way where the dismissive avoidance had this assumption that I don't want to have a partner who's overly reliant on me. And the other person pretended to not be overly reliant and they thought, oh, this is a great match. However, later on, when the anxious preoccupied individual or the fearful avoidant who's leaning out anxious by being with a dismissive avoidant has needs, that is really overwhelming to the dismissive avoidant. And both of them feel really cheated in the relationship because they feel like the other per person is not presenting what they want and they have this cat and mouse game that they play. Number two, I should be able to take space whenever I want to. My partner must always just know that I need space and time and just give me that space and time without me talking about it, without me asking for it, without me conversa con <laughs> conversating, <laughs> having a conversation about it. So my partner must just understand, okay? And that doesn't always work. So the dismissive avoidance tend to just go AWOL 
for sometimes hours, sometimes a day, sometimes even more days. And they just expect for their partner to understand that, hey, I'm fine. I just need my space. I'm taking my space. I don't need to discuss this. Okay, so also when uh, dismissive avoidance haven't healed yet, haven't done uh, personal development, they might be very defensive about their space and they might just say like, hey, what is your problem? You should be secure enough for, to understand that I need my space. Why are you so needy? Okay, it's having needs in a relationship is not bad. Needs, uh, what I always say is what makes the world go around, is what makes the economy go around. Everything is based on a need exchange and we are in a relationship for need exchange. Even the dismissive avoidance need for time and space are needs. They need for autonomy. They are needs. Now the problem comes in where there is no communication. So when the dismissive avoidance learn to tell their partner like, hey, you know what? I'm feeling like I need a little bit of space. It's got nothing to do with you or our relationship. This is just how I process my feelings. This is how I relax. I really need this. And then after a day or maybe two days, how many ever days you guys agree on, I'm going to come back and we're going to do something nice together. Then that changes a lot of things when they can communicate this with their partner and also reassure their partner that nothing is going on with the relationship that is making them withdraw. So this is a big need for time and space and it's got to do with a lot of the time they feel inadequate or like they are not enough. They often have social anxiety that they don't really talk about. And what usually dismissive avoidance don't know about is that they have shame. Especially when it comes to interactions with people and close relationships. So that shame is just something that is with them. They feel like there is something wrong with them. So they tend to isolate so that they can shift through all of those emotions. And often they don't feel that, they just need, they just have this need for space and time. Once the, fear, the dismissive avoidant learns how to process their emotions, learns how to be more vulnerable and communicate their feelings and their needs to their partner, that feeling of inadequacy, the feeling of being engulfed, the feeling of just wanting to disappear and withdraw from the relationship really dissipates. And it's very simple by just having a conversation. I know that in a lot of my videos, I talk about simple things because there are simple things that you can implement. Often they are not easy. Of course, you're going to have some kind of emotional kickback. You know, you're working with a survival mechanism that was created in your childhood. You're trying to go against that. So you're not going to feel comfortable when you are changing these patterns that I talk about. They're going to feel scary. They go, you're going to worry that they're going to have negative consequences. However, if you look at the negative consequences that are created by those survival tactics that we now employ in our adult life, that is going to be the motivating factor. Or the motivating factor could be how healthy your relationships could be when you employ these strategies that I'm talking about. Just a simple thing as telling your partner like, just a heads up, this is what I need. I need a few hours to myself to decompress. Or when I come home from work, I need a few hours to decompress, have a shower by myself, just watch uh, a little whatever YouTube or Netflix by myself for an hour and then I can engage. Then I can help you with the kids or help you with it, then I'm going to be there 200%. Okay, so just being able to communicate and negotiate like that can have huge benefits for your relationships. Number three, relationships should not make me change or compromise my life in any way. And of course, this is a myth. And it comes from the feeling that I am defective. So it is a defense mechanism to block somebody from telling the dismissive avoidant that there is something wrong with them. So maybe somewhere in their childhood, somebody bullied them or just they internalize this feeling that there is something wrong with me because I have these emotions that I don't know what to do with and I 
feel inadequate around people, I struggle with connection. So there is a shameful part that they're trying to hide. Often this is subconscious. They consciously don't know what I'm talking about. So even if you are the dismissive avoidant, you know, this might not click in immediately as I'm talking about this, but if you sit with it and really filter through over the next few days and even weeks after this video, you might see that that content is coming up to the surface, making itself known. So consciously, they just see that, you know, I don't want to compromise. This is the way I am. This is the way I like things my way or the highway type of situation. Um, but that's coming from this fear of somebody telling them like I'm defective or a wound of helplessness that I don't really know how to change. I don't know how to be different. Can I be different? This is what's preoccupying um, dismissive avoidance mind a lot of the time or they fear that they will not be able to change because they've been like this for so long that they doubt their own ability to change and because they have the shame that prevents them from opening up and often seeking help from a coach you know often dismissive avoidance want to solve this by themselves even if they are studying attachment theory they want to learn it from a book they don't want to come to coaching a lot of the time because of that shame. Shame that is often very silent and in the background that is like, I am defective, there's something wrong with me. If I go to see a coach or somebody, they're going to find out, or my partner is going to find out. If we spend a lot of time together, my partner is going to find out that there is something really deep and dark and wrong with me, and they will not want to be with me. They will reject me, which is another core wound that a lot of dismissive avoidance have. Number four, the perfect partner fantasy. Now, dismissive avoidance have not learned how to move through conflict, how to have healthy conflict. They have not uh, learned that conflict can be something that is healthy for the relationship, that you can grow through and get to know each other more, that can make your relationship stronger. So they avoid difficult conversations and they avoid any conflict. Therefore, they have this fantasy that if I'm together with this perfect partner, we are never going to fight. A few core wounds can be included in here, such as the core wound of feeling unsafe. So fear, dismissive avoidance really struggle to feel safe in their own body. Um, they usually are in functional freeze mode, which means that they are in that freeze mode, but they are still functioning in their daily life. If you want me to do a separate video on the nervous system, then just let me know down below. They also feel inadequate to resolve conflict. So that can also add to the fear of conflict and wanting the perfect partner. And number five, they want to be independent and free, just the same as they were when they were single. They want their partner to really just be there as this addition to their life, not interdependent uh, addition. It's kind of like, when everything is good with me, when everything is good with you, and we have the time and we feel like it, then we can meet and interact. And this also comes from fear and that belief that I have to look after myself completely by myself, that if I reveal my needs to somebody else, that is going to make me very vulnerable and that is going to potentially make me unsafe in some way, emotionally unsafe or physically unsafe, depending on their background. And this is it, my friends. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing and sharing these videos. I hope they are helping you. Please let me know down below if you have any comments or questions and I will see you in the next one. Big love.